All right, now in Hebrews chapter 1, I'm going to be focusing in on the first two verses of this chapter that read, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the world. This is explaining how God has spoken to us as people just in general. It says that God at, you know, at sundry times and in diverse manners at different times and in different ways in the past God has spoken to us, has spoken to, to his creation, where his, you know, his people, you know, um, he's spoken to us in different ways using the prophets. He says that in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So he's always used his prophets in order to, to speak to people, in order for us to know more about God and know what God has for us. And then he says in verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. So he says in the past, you know, he's spoken unto us by the prophets. He sent his prophets to get to render God's word unto us and to literally give us the words of God. And we're going to get into this a little bit more specifically. But um, in, in the last days, his son, Jesus Christ, came just without any shadow of doubt, words coming out of his mouth are the words of God, the Son of God in the flesh, preaching and speaking unto us. And that's where we end up ultimately with the New Testament is all based on what the Son had said. All the, you know, whether it's the, the epistles, you know, we still have God's word in, 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 in the epistles of Paul and in all these other letters, but it was, his word was essentially just revealed to us in the last days by his Son. And what the sermon's about this morning is, is just going to be breaking exactly this down is how God speaks to us because there's a lot of people today who might be a little bit confused about this. And understandably so. Now, we as, as, as God's creation, as human beings, innately, it, it just naturally, I think we want to know about God. We, we have this desire, you know, when you know you're a created being, you know that God is real, you, you want to have a communication with God. You want to know, we have this yearning and this desire just to know more about God and, and understand Him a little bit. So in that desire to learn, you know, I think a lot of people end up having some false beliefs about how God actually communicates with us and speaks with us because we want to hear from him. So oftentimes people will look into things a lot deeper than maybe they ought to because they'll think that, oh, this is coming from God. And we need to understand what we saw right here in Hebrews chapter one is that it says that God spake in times past by the, unto the fathers by the prophets. He used the prophets to speak unto people. Um, we're going to see, you know, as we go through a little bit of the Old Testament, I'm not going to go into this very detailed, but you can see that when he spake unto the prophets, he audibly spake to, to, to most of them. There are multiple ways. There's diverse manners in which he did that. But with many of them, like in, in Genesis 3, verse 9, you don't have to turn there. It says, And the Lord called unto Adam and said, said unto him, Where art thou? When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, and God calls out, says, you know, where are you? That's literally God's voice speaking and Adam hearing God's voice. You know, that's, that's, that's pretty obvious. We can see that. And there's other places in Scripture where you'll see God's actually physically speaking to people and they're audibly hearing the Lord. And it says, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. Adam heard God's voice. God spake with men like Noah and Abraham and Moses and Samuel. These people all were able to hear God's voice as he, as he actually delivered his word unto them and spake unto them. Uh, Moses, probably more than just about anybody, had, had a lot of dialogue with God in the Bible. He was a unique person. We're going to get to him in just a minute. Um, and we believe, you know, the Bible is God's word. We believe, as it says in Exodus 20, as he's given out the Ten Commandments, it says in verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, and it's, and it's God's word. This is, this is what we're most interested in anyways, is when we come to church or we're in our lives, we want to know what is God's word? What does God have to tell us? And the only way we're going to know what God has for us is, is through 
His Word. It's not going to come through other means in our life. It's going to have to come through what He has revealed to us and what we know that He's given to us, that, that He's spoken unto the prophets and has given unto us that we have today in Scripture. Now, God does not and He has not spoken audibly with everybody. It's not something that, that just every person who ever lives gets to experience or has experienced. There's actually a very few number of people overall in, in the scope of history that have, have had this type of communication with God. It is, it is very few. That's why God chose the prophets. I mean, in the Old Testament, He chose the nation of Israel. I mean, prior to that, obviously before Israel, there were was, there was certain men that God chose to give His word unto. He gave his word unto Moses, who said he gave him the commandments and everything else. And even the people, when, when all the people of Israel, if you remember, um, when they heard the voice of the Lord, they, they were afraid. They couldn't even handle hearing it themselves. They said, no, you, you go ahead, Moses. You, know, you, you go on up and, and just tell us what God said and, you know, and we'll, we'll do it that way. And... Um, it's a special thing that's happening. And see, the problem is, I think, we tend to, we read the Bible and we see it happening so much because it's God's Word, because it's recorded in this book. It, it almost can give you the false impression that, oh, well, this happens all the time. When, no, it doesn't. We're reading about specific people, individuals, I mean, handfuls. I mean, think about the billions and trillions of people who probably have existed in Earth's history. And... I mean, we know these people by name that are in the Bible. We know Moses. We know David. We know Samuel. We know, you know, we know these guys that God has spoken to. Um, and, and it's not very many people that have received this that, that we can read from from the Bible. But you get this false impression that, oh, no, this must happen to everybody. So it's going to happen to me. It's going to happen to you. That's not the way it works. Um, turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter number 12. And while you're turning there... I'm going to read to you from Ezekiel chapter 3 because Ezekiel 3, there's, it's, it's just basically a, an example scripture from the Old Testament of how the prophets received the word of God. Uh, Ezekiel 3.16 says, And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. And this is exactly how God used the prophets. He would deal with individuals. He would take one individual, like Ezekiel. He would say, okay, I'm going to give you my words. And you need to go and warn this people. This is, you're getting it straight from me, and then you're going to have to deliver my message unto everybody else. And that's, this is the way that God has dealt with us and has given us his information, has revealed his word unto us. He doesn't deal with us all individually giving us his word in this sense. Now, we have his word today, and it's given to all of us, and we have it in scripture. We have God's word. We know exactly what God said unto Ezekiel here because it's recorded in scripture in the book of Ezekiel. This is what we use today. Here in Numbers chapter 12, we're going to see a little bit about Moses because Moses was definitely a special person just in history, and he was, he was a great servant of God, probably one of the best godly people who ever walked this earth was, was Moses. And if you're in Numbers chapter 12, we're going to start reading from verse number 1. The Bible says, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. Um, before we keep reading here, you know, obviously Moses was, was the guy that, that the Lord chose to be his servant, to be his messenger, and to be his deliverer. And if you remember, Moses was really afraid of speaking, and, and, he, and he was real meek, and he didn't really want to go out and do this, and, and he just kept asking God, you know, like, essentially to send someone else. But, and that's when God finally just gave him a little break and said, okay, well, Aaron will speak, but I'm still dealing directly with you. So God was still using Moses as his main instrument, as the person that he was going to be communicating with. And then Aaron can go and, and relay that unto the people after Moses had given it to him. But we have, we have Aaron and Miriam. Now, 
they don't like that Moses married some woman. It's none of their business anyways, but for whatever reason, they don't like this woman that, that Moses married. And now they're thinking, oh, well, what makes Moses so special? You know, he speaks to us too. And God hears this. And see, God's going to intercede for Moses because Moses is a real meek man. He's not going to come railing against them, you know, necessarily for, for doing something that it shouldn't be. He's just going to, you know, he's kind of suffering the, the abuse that he's taken from, these, from Aaron and Miriam. And, um, and God's going to step in here. And so he speaks to all of them and he says, Moses, Aaron, you know, Miriam. You know, come, come over here because he's going he's gonna to straighten this out right away. And they came out, verse number five, it says, And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. So this is some of the other ways that God has spoken with people. We saw God in diverse manners spake in time fast in time best sometimes it was audible like right here they audibly heard his word and they came forward he's like come out and and they came out because they heard his voice speaking unto him but he's explaining you know when there's a prophet he's made himself known in visions in dreams not necessarily this direct communication he would he would open up their understanding and give them the word of the Lord, but it would be oftentimes in a dream or in a vision. And he explains here, verse number seven, why Moses is special. It says, my servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my service, servant Moses? So he's saying, look, for other prophets, you know, I'll speak to them in a dream. I'll give them a vision, but not Moses. He says, Moses, we speak mouth to mouth. He's like, I, I speak to him directly. I'm not giving him any dark sayings or keeping anything back from him. We're speaking mouth to mouth. And you don't have to turn there, but in Exodus 30, 11, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. God spake to Moses just as if he was his friend. That's how close Moses was to God. And that's how special Moses, and, and we see that, I mean, all throughout the Bible, I mean, in the Old Testament especially, obviously, when Moses was going up in the mountain and he's there for 40 days and 40 nights and God gives him the Ten Commandments and, and he gives him all of the instruction on building the tabernacle and, and, and Moses continually is going back and forth between God and the people and he's spending so much time with them that his face was literally shining. His, his face was bright. He had to put a veil over his face to go back and talk to the people because his face had shone so brightly because he had spent so much time with God and in the, in the, glo in the light of God's glory. And in his presence, that it, that it was rubbing off on him so that his face was shining. And, um, you know, Moses was a very special man. And, and we can't forget that. See, when you see God speaking to Moses, you can't just assume that, well, because God spake to Moses, you know, well, he must be speaking to me too. And start listening to hear voices and, and think that that must automatically be God if you hear a voice. Because it's not true. Moses was a special man. And... Um, and we see that God's explaining that here, even to Aaron and Miriam, who also heard the, the, the voice of the Lord. But he's explaining to them, no, Moses is, is very special. So we have to just keep that in mind. Now, um, <clears throat> we call the Bible God's word, right? This is the word of God. This is what is contained in, in, our, in our scripture. So if God were to speak to you, wouldn't it make sense then that we should be adding what God had said to you into God's word and into the Bible? Because I think it would. And, and see, this is one of the reasons I believe that God has revealed, you know, everything that God has revealed unto us is contained in his word and is contained in scripture. People get very careless these days and flippant about saying, oh, God told me this and God told me that and the Lord spoke to me. And um, we were just recently, uh, unfortunately, at a funeral. But the, the, one of the men that was given, that was performing the service, I don't know if he was a pastor. I assume he was. I don't know his title. But he kept saying, you know, I, like, I got a word from the Lord. And now, thank God, this guy was, was right on salvation. He, was, he explained how, you know, it's, a, it's eternal life. 
and that you can't lose your salvation for any reason and everything else. But then he was saying, you know, that was the good part of what he was saying. But the bad, he wasn't using any scripture, unfortunately, but, but the bad part of what he was saying is that he was saying, you know, I got this word from the Lord and he was dealing individually with, with some of the relatives of the deceased. And, and, he, and he literally stopped and said, you know, God, the, the Lord told me that you were going to do thus and so. And right there, it just, it just, this verse, these verses popped in my mind. Turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 28. These verses popped in my mind. Because I'm sitting there thinking, like, did God really tell you that? Which I know he didn't. I know, I know that this is not something that's coming from God. He's just, a lot of people just seem to take this liberty of just saying, well, because they maybe have a feeling in their heart or, or maybe they have an instinct to do something or, or they, have, they have whatever kind of an idea pops up. And they'll take that and then just use that to say, well, God told me this. You can't assume that just because you have some kind of an idea, and maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's a great idea, you know, whatever it is, you can't just assume that God is telling you that, especially when it came down, like in this scenario, he's telling a person, this is what you're going to do with your life. That is wrong. That is unscriptural. That is wrong. He's not getting that from God. This, this popped in my mind, Jeremiah 28, if you're there. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, the prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of, that, of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. Let's jump down to verse 11. It says, And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. And just to get you caught up to speed in this story, basically what Jeremiah is saying here is that Jeremiah had a negative message about being taken into captivity and about Nebuchadnezzar coming, the king of Babylon coming, and, and basically bringing, ju bringing judgment against the children of Israel and that they should just let this happen, don't fight against them. This is a judgment coming from God. And he's explaining here that, hey, look, the other prophets before me, they were also prophesying against the kingdom and, and of wars and of all these things that were coming to pass. He's saying, this isn't something that's just new starting with me. This came um, in time past. So that's why he's saying, if, if someone's going to prophesy peace now, in this time, if you're going to prophesy peace, he's saying, then the, word, the words of the prophet, when they come to pass, when there actually is peace, then that prophet's going to be made known. Then we'll see that. But he's, Jeremiah is basically saying, look, I'm continuing the same preaching and prophesying that has been going on before me about what's happening here. But this Hananiah is saying, nope, you know, in, within two years, you know, that, that the, the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar is going to be gone. We're going to have peace. Jump down to verse 15. The Bible says, Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from, the earth, from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. And um, in, in another scripture, it talks about you know, people saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. And a lot of people claim to be sent from God. I mean, it's all over the place. I mean, we, we have all these different denominations and Christian religions and men standing up behind the pulpit and all of them saying, God said this. But God has not always said that. And, and just because someone claims that doesn't make it true by any stretch. And the way that we know whether something is true or not, I mean, the Bible explains here, especially in the older times, when they're prophesying of a future event, hey, when that comes to pass, then you can know. And he said here, if, hey, if we come to peace... Sure, then you're right. Then you are a prophet of the Lord. But history has proven that that wasn't the case. And Jeremiah already knew because he was receiving a word from the Lord. He knew what God had said. There's no fooling Jeremiah that, you know, this other guy is saying something different. And this is the same way now that we can judge what, when other people start saying something and say, hey, this is what, what God would want you to do. This is what God is saying to us. We need to compare that with the scripture, with what he's already told us. God's not going to contradict his own word. So if someone tells you something, 
you know, God wants you to do this with your life or whatever, make sure it lines up with Scripture first and foremost. Now, it still doesn't mean that God is speaking to that person, but it better line up with what, what, the, what the Bible's saying, which is exactly what Jeremiah had said. He's like, look, what I'm saying lines up with what has already been preached before me by other men of God have said the same exact thing. This is lining up exactly right with the truth and with Scripture. We need to be able to do that um, in our lives and don't be deceived by these people who just continually say, oh, I got this, this message from God and this word of the Lord. And hey, I mean, if, if that guy got that message, if God spoke to him and he heard this voice, I said earlier, why not just add it to the Bible then? Let's add it to God's word. But I think people are going to be a lot more hesitant to do something like that than they are just to, to blow off their mouth and say, oh yeah, the Lord told me this or the Lord told me that. Many people claim to have heard God actually speaking with them. And I actually have heard this quite a bit when I go out soul winning. And I talk to people about salvation. And um, turn, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. And I've heard this on more than one occasion of, of people saying, well, God has, has spoken to me in a still, small voice. And they get that from Scripture. So we're going to turn to that place of Scripture where it says that. But just because you know the Bible, just because you know it says this, doesn't, still doesn't mean that that's God. That's right. Now, I, don't believe, I do believe these people when they say they hear stuff. I mean, mo I'm not saying they're all necessarily telling the truth. Again, maybe it's something that's, that's a thought that's coming up in their head. But I believe some people probably are hearing voices. But it doesn't mean it's from God. And, and that's, that's, it's probably not from God. If you're hearing voices, it's probably not. Again, look at how few people have actually heard God's word that's recorded in Scripture, at least. And, and it's very unlikely that you are directly audibly hearing from God's word, from the voice of God. But I've heard people say this, and they'll say, if you, you know, I'm sitting, I'm meditating, I'm listening real closely, and then I hear, hear this, this small, still voice. And um, let's look, if you are in 1 Kings 19, let's look at this story in verse number 9. It says, And he came thither unto a cave. This is about, talking about Elijah. Okay, this is Elijah, um, God speaking to Elijah. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong, and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And this is where people get this from in Scripture of saying, well, they've heard the voice of God. Well, what do you sound like? Oh, it's a still, small voice. Verse number 13 says, And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Um, one thing I think that people are noticing when they just they like to focus in on his still small voice is that when God arrived to speak unto Elijah, his presence was made known. There was no mistaking that this was God when um, it says that there was a great strong wind that rent the mountains. That means it broke the mountains. I mean, the mountains were being, were being broken down at the presence of the Lord. He break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Um, it says, but God wasn't in the wind. After wind, an earthquake. And God wasn't in the earthquake. And then um, a fire. God's presence was made known very dramatically unto Elijah. And um, all this prior to hearing that still small voice. And you think of other times as well in the Bible when, when God has spoken audibly. It sounds like the, it's described as a voice of, of many waters and thunderings. And, and when, when Paul was on the road to Damascus, 
And God spake unto Jesus, spake unto Paul, those that were with him that didn't hear the voice, they, 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 it sounded like thunder. Um, this is what scripturally is accounted for when, when God speaks unto people. It's, it's not something that you're just going to be sitting in your room and all of a sudden you hear a voice right. and, and that's God speaking to you. But, but unfortunately, a lot of people are deceived by this. And again, now, I believe it's possible. I believe that devils are real. I believe angels are real. I believe there's a spiritual realm to this world that we can't physically see with our eyes. Again, that's recorded in Scripture. When you see Elisha and, and his servant were surrounded by, or they're being surrounded by the enemy, was coming to attack them and to come after them. And Elisha opened up the eyes of his servant and said, you know, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And he was able to actually see the, the angels and the chariots that were guarding them and protecting them. They exist. They're real. God created these beings and there's battles going on. There's spiritual warfare that we can't physically see, yet they exist and they're there. So that's why I say sometimes when I think when someone hears a voice, they may really be hearing a voice. There may not be another person in the room with them, but they might be hearing the voice of a devil. And as is the case with so many other false religions, you look at the Mormon religion, you look at the Islam religion, they all claim to have heard and gotten wisdom from an angel, from an angel of God. So that's what they think. You know, it's coming from angels. But Galatians 1 teaches us that um, what we're supposed to do, and I'm going to read it. I've got it partially memorized, but it's better just to read it. In Galatians 1, the Bible says in verse 8, Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. So he's saying, look, even if an angel from heaven comes and tells you something, if it's, if it's another gospel, hey, let him be accursed. That is not from God. That is not the word of the Lord. So do people hear things? Yeah, they probably do. But is it coming from God? Definitely not if it's not lining up with Scripture. If it's another gospel like the gospel of Islam of the work salvation or the gospel of the Mormons, which is a work salvation, or the gospel of any of these other false religions that claim to have gotten revelation from God that are work salvations, hey, that ought to be a curse. That is not from God. I don't care if you heard a voice. It's not from God. Now, what we also have to understand is the difference between God's leading and guiding us as opposed to him speaking unto us audibly. And we don't want to make that mistake of saying, well, God told me this when, you know, maybe you're led that way. And there is a leading. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 16. We're going to see this real briefly with the Holy Spirit. Because God has given us the Holy Spirit that indwells us as believers. We do have that. We do have a guiding. God will lead us. If we're walking in his path, if we're doing what's right, if we're, if we're obeying and listening to God, he will lead us and he will direct us. But it doesn't mean that you're going to hear him audibly speaking unto you specifically. And we don't want to confuse the two. Verse, chapter number, John 16 and verse number 13. John 16, 13 says, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. This is talking about the Holy Spirit guiding us into all truth, showing us. And one of the ways the Holy Spirit does that is when we read God's Word, He helps us to understand that and understand what it is. So, give you, give you a, a simple example, right, for myself personally. I'm obviously pastoring this church here in Prescott Valley, Arizona. Now, did God tell me, David, I want you to pastor a church in Prescott Valley, Arizona at 7623 East Las you know, like this is where you're going. No, God didn't say that. Now, when I was meditating and contemplating on, on doing the service of the Lord and being a pastor, when I came to the decision, it was based on Scripture. The Bible says that he that desireth the office of a bishop desireth a good thing. I know God wants people to become pastors and teachers and, and to start churches and to, and to preach the gospel to every creature. I know God wants us to do these things because it's found in Scripture. The next thing was I had to check the qualifications. Well, can I do this? Am I, am I disqualified from doing this position? 
And I found that, no, I, 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 from everything I can tell, I believe that, that, that I fit the bill. And um, I know that, you know, I, I've been in communication also with my pastor and, um, you know, I'm doing this and, and he was, he was all for it too. I ended up getting ordained. But when I decided on where to live and what to do, it wasn't some revelation from the Lord that, that, oh, this is where you have to be. I made my decision on, on a lot of different reasons. I mean, the, the, what I like to do, being out in this country. Now, obviously, I looked also to see if there were any other good churches here, and it seemed to be a dearth. There seemed to be a lack, which is one of the reasons why I picked this place, because we need the gospel being preached everywhere. But there was a lot of other, another host of reasons. But that also doesn't mean that God wasn't leading me here. See, it, just because God didn't speak to me audibly and tell me this is where you need to be, doesn't mean that this isn't the place that God was intending for me to be. It doesn't mean that he wasn't leading my steps and directing my paths and opening up certain doors and closing certain other doors for me without my knowledge. But that's, a, that's different. There's a difference between that and actually hearing God speak to you. And um, that we just make sure that we have this distinction down because God does lead us. He does. And that's clear in Scripture. He will do that. And I believe wholeheartedly that God has led me to this place to be here. And, and I believe that's been evident in the work that's already been done in other people's lives. And, and in what we've already done here to this point and in many other reasons with just I was able to see God's hand and getting us into this house and getting, you know, just, just so many things worked out for us that... Um, would be too much of a coincidence for everything to work out the way it has for this not to be the right place. But at the same time, I wasn't just hearing some voice speaking to me directly and saying, this is what I want you to do. Now, Peter is someone, turn if you would to um, 2 Peter chapter number 1, because Peter is someone that actually did hear God's voice. Obviously, he heard the voice of Jesus Christ. He was one of his disciples. He was walking around with them in his ministry. He heard him preaching directly. But he also heard the voice of God when they were in the mount. When Jesus was transfigured before them and he spake unto Moses and Elijah, Peter heard God's voice. And we're going to see a little bit about this in, in 2 Peter chapter 1. Keep your finger there because we're going to turn between 2 Peter 1 and then we're going to go to John 21. We're going to, we're going to look up some of these references. There's, some, he's refer there's some, some events that are referenced in 2 Peter 1. So I just wanted you to keep some fingers in these places. And then we're going to go to Matthew 17. But the main, the main passage is going to come from 2 Peter chapter 1. So in 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse number 14. The Bible says that knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Now, this is Peter speaking that he needs to put off this tabernacle. Talking about his body. He's going to die. He said, I must... I must um, shortly I must put off my tabernacle. He said, shortly I'm going to die. Even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. So Jesus explained to Peter that how he was going to die. If you remember, it's, and this is in John chapter 21. Um, this is something that, that Jesus literally did speak to Peter that, that, he, that this was going to happen. John 21, 18 says, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. So, this is something that he heard and he knew directly from Jesus Christ about him. And um, Jesus had showed him that. And he showed him this specifically. And this is why he knew it. And that's why I just wanted to go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. I just wanted to show you that in John 21 that Jesus literally showed him this. He, he told him that specifically when he was still alive on the earth. Tell, or when he was um, audibly speaking to them on this earth. It was after he was um, glorified, but um, after he was resurrected. But... Um, he told him that. Let's keep reading here. Verse 15 says, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables 
when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. So this is another real event that Peter is recounting here. It, it actually happened. And this was in Matthew, one of the references in Matthew 17. When Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, they went up with Jesus into the mount, and they literally heard the voice of God saying those exact words, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 17, verse 4 says, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, I know I'm, I'm kind of dragging through this, but it, it's on purpose. I want to just make sure that we understand that when Peter is recounting these things, when he said he heard the voice of God, when he said Jesus showed this unto him, it has already been recorded. These are things that literally were spoken in. This isn't something that he conjured up in his mind. He didn't conjure up how he was going to die or that he knew he was going to die by, by even some extra special revelation. He'd already been told this stuff. And, and he heard the voice of God here. But listen to what he says here because he's just recalling this story of, of hearing God's voice in that mountain when Jesus Christ was transfigured before him. Look at what he says in verse number 19 in, of 2 Peter 1. So we're sorry, I'm making sure we're in the right place. 2 Peter 1, back to, to what he's saying. He says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, if you caught that in verse 19, it says, We have a more sure word of prophecy. Even though he was in that mountain, he was in there with Jesus Christ, he heard God's voice. He says, We have a more sure sure word of prophecy than that. Even then that experience of being up there and hearing the voice of God, it's more sure hearing God's word in Scripture. This is more sure. And the reason why it's more sure is because it's already been tested and tried and true and it's come to pass and you know that it's true. It's been passed down. This is a more sure word. What he heard up in that mount and, and how sure can you be about what you hear? I mean, you could generally think that you're pretty sure, right? I mean, if you, if you have this experience and you were in the mountain, you hear this voice, you witnessed it, you were there, you could testify to that. But he's saying that God's word in the scripture, we have a more sure word of prophecy right here. And he says, Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. People like to put so much emphasis, and the Mormons do this especially, they put so much emphasis on their experience. Yeah. And they think that, well, I see that in the Bible or whatever, but, you know, I had this great experience and I had this overwhelming feeling of joy and, and God spoke to me and I got, you know, he told me all this stuff. He's like, and, and I know this is true because it happened to me and, and they're not willing to listen to anything else. Right. But they're deceived. If it's contradicting God's word, they're deceived. And this is the more sure word of prophecy. This is what we need to be relying on, not something that we hear. And, and you know, oftentimes we like to think, too, that, you know, maybe when some, someone else is speaking unto you and someone else is telling you, we have this tendency to think, well, maybe God led them to say that to me individually. And you start giving more weight to things that people say because you sort of think it's coming from God. And in church, you got to be careful about this because it could be coming from other church members, people who mean well, people who aren't trying to go out and deceive you. But when you are making a judgment, when you hear different opinions, because people will come to you and say, hey, and, and oftentimes it's when things might be going wrong in our life. Right? We're having problems. We're having things that are going on. You know, we're having relationship problems. We're having financial problems. We're having whatever kind of things are going wrong. You're looking for an answer. And we're all looking for answers to the problems in our life. 
But when you hear somebody tell you something, even especially if it's someone from church, you know, they're meaning well, they're trying to help you, but don't give it so much weight to the point where you think that, well, this must be God giving me my answer through this person. You don't know that. And I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that that's impossible, that what they're, you know, because if what they're saying is true, if what they're saying lines up with Scripture and is accurate, then you can apply that and take it for what it is and take it for God's word, but not for their word. Don't necessarily think that God is just trying to, to tell you something that this is the way it is and whatever problem you're having, it's because of this. And, and there's a lot of times, see, most often we don't, we don't know why things are going on in our life. We don't. Most of the time, when, there's, when, when tribulations come, when trials come, we don't really know what the true cause is. And oftentimes, there can be a bunch of different reasons. Um, sometimes, you know, we might, <clears throat> we might think that, um, or actually sometimes, not we might not think, but sometimes the circumstances can be attributed to our own sins, right? God might be casting judgment upon us for some reason. That is definitely scriptural and that is true. We might be reaping something that we've sown. It might be something very recent in our life, something that's going on right now. Or it may even be something that we've done years in the past that's now catching up with us. Some of the sins that we've sown in our life, maybe even a decade ago, who knows? We know that, that when we sow to the wind, we're going to reap the whirlwind, but we don't know exactly when that's going to happen. See, we can't just think that based on our circumstances that, that God is just immediate with every single thing you do. Like, oh, I did wrong here, and then it's just, boom, it's going to come down immediately, and, just, and you're going to experience that retribution, or you're going to reap what you've sown. No, anytime you sow anything, it takes a while before you end up reaping it. So when problems arise in your life, because of that, we don't know if it, if it is something that it's more of a quick rebuke or if it's something we've sown in the past or it might not have anything to do with our sin at all. We can have problems that come as a result of other people's sins and we can also just have just other events happen in our life. Maybe we're being tried. Maybe you're being persecuted by the devil. There are lots of reasons that we can't really know the answer to of why things might be going on in our life. But what we can do is this. We can just look and see what we have control over. If the devil's attacking, you have no control over that. You can't do anything. All you can do is resist him. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. That's all you can do. And the way you resist him is just staying strong and staying founded and staying firm in God's word and not compromising, not backing down. And you'll find that all these answers are going to be basically the same thing. If it's sin in your own life, all you can do about it is get yourself right with God. Get founded in His Word. Get into the Bible and just, and just try to get whatever sins out of your life. If it's something you've done already in the past, there's nothing you can do about that. It's already been done. You're going to have to reap it. But what you can do is keep trying to do right. Keep trying to live right. Confess and forsake your sins unto God. You've done something in the past that's wrong. Go through, you know, confess it unto God. Tell Him you're sorry and... and and you, you know, you won't, you're going to try to live right. Everything that we do, all you can have control over is yourself and what you do. And you want to be careful when you're receiving advice from somebody um, because we probably don't know what the real cause is. Now, again, I mean, someone might say, oh, well, well you have this sin in your life and that's why God's not blessing you and that's why you're not getting this or that's why you're not getting that or that's why you're going through this problem. That may or may not be the case. Now, if it's true, if you do have a certain sin in your life, hey, try to work on getting that sin out of your life. Absolutely. Amen. That's good. But, but just because someone says something doesn't make it so. I mean, just because they say, oh, well, this must be the reason why. It's not necessarily the reason. And also, if you're married, be very, very careful about this because I've heard this happen with people before. When you're start, people start blaming their spouse for something that might be going wrong in their life. And, some that, and say, oh, well, God's not blessing me because my husband is this or my wife is that. Don't fall into that trap. All you can do is focus and worry about yourself. Make sure that you, I mean, obviously love your spouse and try to help them out where you can. But what you don't want to do is start blaming them. Because when you start blaming them for things, especially you don't even know. You don't know what the reason is. 
You can't prove what the reason is why you might be experiencing a certain problem or going through a certain thing. You can, you can fix the things in your own life and that's it. And, and maybe things will change, maybe they won't. It depends on what the reason is why you're going through that problem. But when you start blaming your spouse, it's going to cause bitterness. And that bitterness is going to fester and it's going to grow and it's going to destroy your marriage. You don't want to be blaming your spouse for things. And, I don't, and maybe they are wrong in doing things. Maybe they have sins. And you're like, but you know what? You've got sin in your life too. Don't be so quick to point the finger to somebody, at somebody else and say, this is the reason why things are going bad in our marriage or in our life or, or why we don't have good finances or whatever because you know, my husband's lazy or, or you know, my wife's not doing her job at home or whatever the reason may be. Don't allow yourself to get that bitter feeling and that blame being directed at your spouse. Why don't you just work harder? Why don't you just see what you could do to be a better Christian and to live right? And, and, to, and to, if your spouse does have a legitimate problem that's a blaring problem, try to help them instead of trying to blame them. Think of what you can do that would be a help unto them that, 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 could, that, that will you know, help them to get right with God. Because you're in this together. You, the last thing you want to do is start doing a blame game back and forth. And, you know, you don't want to do that with other people in the church or with anyone else for that matter. You don't want to be doing this, this blame game. Focus on yourself on what you can do to help others. And when I say focus on yourself, I'm not saying be selfish and just be self-centered and think about yourself. Think about how you can do right by God. Because doing right by God is going to be being a minister unto others, preaching the gospel unto others, you know, putting others above yourself. And when you have that meek, humble attitude like Moses had, then you can get really close to God. And then you'll know a lot more of, of what God is trying to tell you. But it's going to come through His Scripture and through the Word. It's not going to come something that's audible and something you're going to hear. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for speaking to us directly through your Word. God, I pray that you would please help us not to, to get caught up in this experiential um, belief system where people just, just really have a, a warped view on things based on just certain events that happen in their life. Dear God, help us just have faith in your word and, um, and to make sure that everything lines up with scripture, dear God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.